Hello, welcome to this screencast offered by the library at the University of Queensland. My name is Stefan and we're going to have a look at heat maps today with R and R Studio. So a different kind of visualization. There's some kind of, uh, oh, well, there's a, a big variety actually of packages and functions that you can use to create this particular kind of visualization. And we're going to have a look at mainly four different methods today to visualize data in a grid and color cells accordingly. So what we're going to have a look at is how we can produce a simple heat map with the base function heat map. We're also going to install a couple more packages to access extra functions like heatmap.2 and pheatmap. And we will also use the ggplot2 package to create a rudimentary heat map or heat map like visualization. It is one of the most popular packages around, so we'll see how we can do something like a heat map with a particular geometry. So let's first start with creating a project in our studio and creating a new script, and then we'll get into trying those different options and also manipulating some data because there might be some data manipulation you need to do before being able to create a heat map. We also see options to import data and to generate random data. So this is our studio. This is what it looks like on my computer. What I'll do first is go to my new project menu, my project menu here. Click on that and select new project here. I'll select new directory, new project, and I'm going to support the, uh, excuse me, to name this one heat maps. This is the name of our project, the directory that's going, going to be created. And I will save this as a subdirectory of my R projects. So inside our projects, I will create a new project called heatmaps. And this will keep everything nicely contained in one single directory. So we move to this new project. The working directory for R is now this directory here. As you can see under R projects, it's called heatmaps. I've got a new session, I've got an empty environment. I'm also going to create a script to work with code more comfortably. I can select the new file menu here and the first item in the list is new R script. This opens my source pane when I, where I'm going to start typing code and I can also document my code with comments. So the description here today is intro to heat maps in R. And our first example today is using the base function. So our first header, base function, heatmap. The first data set that we use today is called empty cars and it's straight away available in BASAR. You can find more information about this particular data set with the command question mark empty cars. I can execute this from my script window or script pane. Remember you can use the control plus enter shortcut to execute from the script pane or you can also use the run button here. So in my help page or help pane, I can see that this data set is related to motor trend car road tests and it be, it's been gather, gathered from a magazine from 1974. And there's a few characteristics sort of a few different cars here. So what's important to notice is that those are 11 numeric variables and this is suited to be represented as a heat map because each cell in our heat map will be associated to a color and we'll be able to easily visualize highs and lows in this visualization in this grid. 
So we've got 32 rows and 11 columns. And we'll try and execute a command to visualize that as a heat map. Now the function in base R is called heat map. And the only argument that we absolutely have to provide this function is where the data comes from. So I'll start with empty cars straight away and try and execute that. Now I get an error. In my console you can see here error in heat map empty cars. X must be numeric, a numeric matrix. And this is something that we can see in the command or in the description of the function heat map. You can see in the list of arguments here the first one is numeric matrix of the values to be plotted. Now the data that we're using currently, if I do class on empty cars, it shows me in the console that it's a data frame. So this is not suited for this particular function. What a heat map function absolutely wants is only a grid of numbers and matrices are suited for that because they only accept one class of data. So what I will do now is convert from a data frame to a matrix. And the function I can use for that is called data.matrix. So I'll start with creating an object called empty cars underscore mat and use the data.matrix function to convert this data frame empty cars. If I execute this I end up with a matrix in my environment called empty cars underscore mat, a numeric matrix with 32 rows and 11 columns. If I look at it I can click on this space here or on the spreadsheet icon in my environment and I can have a look at the data. Notice that I still have my variable names in my column headers and I have got also row headers, row names. Before I keep going I want to save my script, make sure I, know I don't lose it. I can use this floppy disk icon here or I can use Control S and by default it saves it in the current working directory. So I'll save it as process and RStudio will add the dot capital R extension to it. So remember to frequently save your script. Now that we have a matrix, a numeric matrix, we'll be able to use the heat map function. But this time it's empty cars underscore mat. Let's have a look at this. So on your computer it might look different depending on the version of R that you are using. If I scroll up to the top on my in my console I can see the version of R that I'm currently using. It's 3.6.0. And when 3.6 was released it, bring, it brought in a couple of modifications of default palettes in use. So for heat map, the heat map function specifically, you might have different colors applied to your visualization if you've got an earlier version of R. So first of all, we notice that it's not really what we wanted here. We've got a big chunk on the left of our visualization that's completely white or yellow and then a couple of variables on the right that are more red. So the issue here is that we can't really spot highs and lows in our different variables, in our different characteristics of cars. So what we can do is have another look at the help page for heat maps, heat map function. And the important argument in here that we need to have a look at is the scale argument. So I'll highlight this session section and it's a character indicating if the values should be centered and scaled in either the row direction or the column direction or none. And the important bit here is that the default is row. So our data has been scaled and centered 
in the row direction. But what we really want here, I'll go back to my plot, is to scale in the column direction because we want to see highs and lows in each one of our variables. So we'll change that. Again, running heatmap on empty cars underscore mat and change that scale argument from its default value to column. Now we get something a bit more interesting. So they said for lows we've got clearer, or I might not have mentioned that, we've got clearer colors, so yellow, light yellow for low values, and we've got red for high values. This might be inverted, as I said, if you've got an earlier version of R. So I think this is a good development in the latest version because it's a more intuitive scale for heat maps. People usually expect red to be a high value. So now we can spot interesting things. For example, we can see that Cadillac, Fleetwood, Lincoln, Continental, Chrysler, Imperial are grouped together, have similar uh, values for displacements for the size of the, uh, the engine, whereas uh, we've got lower values for the cars like those two Fiat models and Toyota Corolla and Honda Civic. So smaller engines here, whereas if we look at a different related variable, MPG, miles per gallon, we can see that they're well, f well um, they are more efficient the Fiat's and the Toyota and the Honda are more efficient at using petrol, whereas the Cadillac, Lincoln and Chrysler are less efficient. Right here, on this side. So we've got some grouping that has happened, it's called the clustering in a heat map. And according to a function, each row and each column has been compared to each other. And you can see this tree-like structure on each side of the heat map, top and left. Those are called the dendrograms. And they explain how related or how comparable each one of those rows and columns are. So it creates groups and you can kind of spot those panels on the heat map itself. You can see that, for example, the lower half shows higher cylinders and the upper half lower cylinders, and that's probably related to other variables like disp and hp. So we can see this difference, we can see that the function has tried to group different rows, different cars, and different variables together. So in our case, grouping variables is not, is not necessarily particularly important or interesting. What we really want to visualize is how related cars are. So we might want to play with more arguments to make our visualization better. First thing we can do is change colors. If you're interested in colors, you can change the default color palette from the default heat map palette. That's the one that's used before version 3.6 of R. In the more recent one, it's using a more elaborate color, um, function called hcl.colors. So here we'll change to a palette called cm.colors. cm.colors stands for cyan to magenta colors and we have to specify how many colors we want in that palette. palette. We want 15 colors in our case and if I execute this I end up with this different visualization. I can look for help on cm colors if I press F1 with my cursor in the name of the function. And this is a help page that groups information about several palette functions. Those are the original color functions that you can use, rainbow, heat colors, terrain colors, topo colors, and CM colors. Heat colors is the one that was used as a default heat map palette. We just use CM colors and specify that we wanted 15 different colors in this palette. But if you want, you can also play around with this newer function, hcl.colors, that is supposed to be um, more accessible, easier to spot differences for, uh, for the human eye. So the default one here used in this example, or when you use hcl.colors 
as it is is Viridis. But in the case of the heat map, it uses a palette called uh, YLORRD, and that stands for yellow, orange, red. If you want the list of colors that are available, you can use this function here, hclpals. So if I exec execute hcl.pals, I'll get all the different names of palettes that I can use in the function hcl colors. And if I scroll down, I should see here the default one that's used in a heat map in R3.6, yellow, orange, red. So you can feel free to play around with those ones using HCL colors and then changing the palette and the number of colors that you want in that palette. But here we'll stick to CM colors and move on to removing dendrograms. So this is to list color palettes available. Now what I want to do is remove a dendrogram. So again using the heat map function we'll stick to using empty cars underscore mat as our data. Scale still has to be in the column direction and here the third argument that I'm going to use is called col v. Now notice that it's a capital V. It determines if and how the column dendrogram should be reordered. And I'm going to set this to NA, non available. Now I've got more space for my visualization. I don't have this useless dendrogram at the top that doesn't really mean much. And if you look at my uh, and my previous visualization, you'll see that the variables at the bottom are reordered. That's what we expect from a dendrogram. If I go back to my current one, this is the original order of my variables. If I look at in the console call names of my matrix, mtcars underscore mat, you can see the original order of variables. It starts with MPG and finishes with carb, and this is respected here because we didn't use a dendrogram. Right, so this is it for this first function. There's quite a few more arguments that you can use with this heat map function from BASAR. We won't go too much into detail, but you can explore those ones in the help page. So to clean up our environment. I can use the rm function and use the list argument to remove everything with the ls function. So ls will list all the objects in my environment, currently only one. So it's a bit of an involved way to clean up the environment here, but it is it is a way that will always work to clean up and move on to something else. So I can execute this and my environment is empty as you can see it here. Now let's move on to method 2, which is using the package gplots and inside it the function heatmap.2. Now I can add a header to my script by using four dashes and do the same on number 1 here, so I can quickly navigate between the different methods base function, heatmap, gplots, heatmap.2. If you need to install the package, you can run the install.packages function on the gplots package. So use the gplots string and you can execute this command and get the package installed from the official repositories. So I already have the package on my computer what I'm going to do now is load the package with the library function and use gplots as an argument. It's giving me some feedback in the console telling me that one particular function, lowest, is masked from the package stats. So 
important information here just to let us know that the lowest function from gplots takes priority from now on. Now let's look up some information about heatmap.2. Heatmap.2 is based on the original heatmap function. It has the same description to start with here. It's described as, well first it describes what a heatmap is, a false color image with a dendrogram added to the left side and or to the top. Typically reordering of the rows and columns according to some set of values, usually the means, within the restrictions imposed by the dendrogram is carried out. Now it adds an extra line here, this heatmap provides a number of extensions to the standard R heatmap function. And a number is an understatement. Uh, if you scroll through usage, you'll see how many more arguments there are to this function. So there's quite a bit here, a lot to play around with. So we'll only have a look at a handful here. The data that we're going to play with now is from a protein data set. So we're going to import protein data from the web. To do that you can go to the course notes and copy this particular link. So if you scroll down to method 2 and protein data example. There is a link here that you can copy. This one here. So it ends with lian test data dot csv. And I'm going to paste that into a read dot csv function. So remember that you can import data straight from the internet using a URL. And I'm going to save that as raw data. So read.csv reads from this particular URL. Remember to use the double quotes. And when I execute this, I get a data frame again in my environment. There's the variables that it contains. There's 63 observations and 8 variables. So what we've got here is 6 columns that contain the actual data that we want to represent on our heat map. And we've got also row ID and T test. So we might want to do some manipulation here to clean up this data frame, remove the row the var variables that we don't want to keep, and also rename a couple of uh, headers. So let's do that. Let's clean up some data. First of all, I'm going to replace raw data with itself, but indexing to only select column 2 all the way to 7. So remember that when you index with the square brackets, the first element before the comma is the rows that you want to keep. We want to keep them all now, so we're leaving it blank. But the second element on the right of the comma is the columns that you want to keep. And I'm indexing 2 all the way to 7. This is a sequence. If I execute 2, colon 7, I get the numbers 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So it means that when I execute this, I end up with only the control and treatment variables. Another thing I can do is use the call names function on raw data. And it's a function that allows overwriting. So if I execute only this part of the function, I get the column names of my data frame. But if I use the assignment operator after, afterwards and then provide a list of values, I can also replace the names. So I'll use first a paste function to create the control headers. I'm going to use the control word, a sequence of numbers from 1 to 3, and then a separator that is the underscore. And after this first paste uh, function, I can use a second one to paste together treatment this time, and then the same 
number one all the way to three, and the same separator. You can execute only this C function to see what it outputs. I end up with six names, control one, control two, control three, treatment one, treatment two, and treatment three. And if I apply the full, the full function or the full command, you can see that my names are updated in my environment. Control one, control two, control three, treatment one, treatment two, treatment three. So the only thing you really need to do here is guarantee that you've got the right order. Right. We've got a data frame here, so remember that we need to convert that to a matrix. Heatmap.2 also requires for x, its x argument a numeric matrix, just like the heatmap function. So I'm going to convert this to a matrix. I'm going to call it data.mat. And use the data dot matrix, or data underscore mat, sorry, and use the data dot matrix function on raw data. And here's my up the top new object called data mat, a numeric matrix of size 63 by 6, and this is a sample of the values. Now we can finally create a heat map. Or a heatmap.2 rather. Heatmap.2 on data underscore mat. So here's something that might happen often with this particular function. You can see in the console error in plot new, figure margins too large. So that's often why you won't see any key. One of the default things that come up when you do a heatmap.2 heatmap is a key and histogram that appears to the top left. So we can't see it here. I'm going to try and make this slightly bigger and run this again. So let's see if it comes up with it. Yeah, there it is, color key and histogram. So make sure that you've got enough space there for it to appear. So this is the default look of heatmap.2. We only provided the data here. And again, we probably have a scaling issue here. We have mostly very light colors, which means very high values for this particular palette. Now this is, in this version of R, it's using the heat colors palette and the lighter colors as you can see in the color key will be for higher values the red colors will be for the lower values so very high values here everywhere we can't really compare how proteins react to the treatments so we might want to play again with scaling and I'll go back to my help page here and go to the scale argument so under the header data scaling, we can see that there's a list of values that's allowed for the scale argument, and the first one is none. So the default value here is none. I can also scroll to the detailed description, and it confirms here the default is none. So what we want in this particular visualization, we want to scale in the row direc direction because we want to see highs and lows for each protein we want to see how a protein has reacted to a particular treatment. So I'm going to go scale equals row and see what it does. There we go. So this is more readable. With the scaling of the data, I can see that some proteins, for example the top few ones here, have been down-regulated. Well, so it looks, as far as I can understand the data set, um, by the treatments and others with lighter colors here, for example, have been upregulated compared to the control. Now notice a big difference with the previous visualization. 
it doesn't look like our proteins have been clustered and grouped. It doesn't look like the dendrogram took into account the scaled data. The reason for that is that heatmap.2 does the clustering before the scaling step. So that's a big difference. I will um, remind you at the end of the session what the core differences are between the main functions. So what we might have to do here is do a little bit more data manipulation before we put it into heatmap.2 because we want to take into account that scaling before clustering. So let's scale the data before visualizing. One way to do that is to use the scale function. And I'll bring up the help page for scale. It's from the, the base package and it allows to scale and center matrix-like objects. So by default it will both center and scale and you end up with data that is more comparable. So that's what's being used in the heat map functions. And what we want to do now is create a new data set that is already scaled. Notice something important here is that scale is a function that will center and scale the columns of a numeric matrix. There's no argument here that allows us to change from scaling the columns to scaling the rows. So what we'll do instead is transpose the data set with the T function, transpose transposes the matrix to scale the data and then transpose it back to its original shape. So we'll flip it, scale it and flip it again. I'm going to call the final object data underscore scaled. Use the T function on the scaled data after we already transposed it. So you can read it from inside out. I'm using three functions here. First I've got the object data mat and I want to first transpose it, then scale it, and finally transpose it again. So once I do that, I end up with the same structure, 63 rows and 6 variables, but with scaled data. So if I look at my original data mat, I can have a look at the, the values. You can see that the first protein here has values between 7, 6, or around 7 and 6. Number 3 here has values between 3, 2, etc, etc. There's different ranges here. So what we want to do is make all those proteins comparable between each other, or at least their responses comparable to between each other. So the scaling, if I open now my data scaled, has scaled and centered around zero. Now you can see that the data is a lot more uniform and now we are able to compare between proteins. So back in my script, I'm going to make use of this and call the heatmap two function and instead of data mat I'm going to use data underscore scaled. Notice that I don't need to use this scale argument anymore because I've already scaled the data. So I can execute that and now you can see the obvious difference here is that now we've got groups according to the scaled data. We've got up the top proteins that were upregulated by the treatments and at the bottom, proteins that were down-regulated by the treatments. Okay, so let's move on to some more control over colors. Control without an E here. We can create our own 
palette functions. I can create a new function called my underscore palette, use the assignment operator, and use a function called color ramp palette. Notice in the description here, in the help, it says that this function returns a function. So it doesn't return necessarily just a value or a series of colors, it returns an actual function. So color ramp palette, we can in there determine the values that we want to use for the lower limit, higher limit, and the, mid the middle. So I'm going to start with blue, then for the middle I want white, and finally I want red for the higher values. So I'm concatenating a list of three colors here and providing that as the values for my color ramp palette function. And once I execute this, you can see in the environment I have indeed a function called my palette that takes one n argument just like the cm colors function. So let's use that inside heatmap.2. I'm still using data scaled and we want to use the color or the colors provided by my palette where the number of colors is 20. And here you go. We've got blue for low values, red for high values. This might be a bit more intuitive and you can confirm that in the color key that shows you this range and also a histogram of how the data is distributed. Those blue lines are called traces. If you want to remove those ones, you can. If you think it's a bit too busy, you can set trace to none. So it's a string, none. Those traces on the visualization on the heat map shows you where on the range those, those particular cells are, are uh, positioned on the lower end to the left, on a higher end to the right. So we can turn that off if we want with trace equals none. We still have the histogram on the key. So a few more arguments that you might want to change. If you want to, to remove the clustering on columns, you can use col v very similarly to what we did before. We don't necessarily want to reorder our treatments here or our controls, so we can go col v equals na. So now we've got back to one, two, three, one, two, three at the bottom. All right. Another thing we can do is give a main title and come up with a good title here. Here it is. We can play around with things like margins, key size. So if I want to give more, give more space to my labels, I can say, for example, concatenated list of values here, six and four to give more space from the border. So a bit less space for the protein labels and a bit more space for my control and treatment labels. And finally I can modify the font size. So CEX row will be for the row font. I'm going to make that smaller. And then CEX call will be 0 0.80, also smaller. All right, so now I've got labels that fit into my visualization. I've got a title, I've removed the trace, and I've removed the dendrogram for the columns. If you want, you can click on Zoom to have a better look at your visualization. And when you're happy with the visualization, you can also use the export menu and one of those will suit you. Copy the clipboard directly to a presentation or document, save as PDF for a vector graphic, or save as image for more options, including raster graphics. 
We often get little warnings with this particular function. Um, there's some information about call v. So it lets you know what's it, what it's doing automatically when it makes sense. You might also get warnings about graphic states or even a visualization that doesn't come up at all. So if you if you ever get an issue with graphic states or with a graphic device that is stuck somewhere, the magic word is to use the function devof, and I might have I might need to do that uh, eventually. We'll see what happens. But if you see something about invalid graphic device or invalid graphic state, execute this function devof to kill the graphic device and restart it, and you should be good to go. For this particular warning here, the discrepancy, um, I might play around with another argument. For example, if I want to only show the road endogram, but still keep the reordering or clustering of my columns, I can set dendrogram to row. So I don't get a warning anymore. You can see that my dendrogram for column has disappeared for the columns, but I still get the reordering, the clustering here. Control 1, Control 2, Control 3, Treatment 2, Treatment 1, Treatment 3. So there's a few different options here depending on if you want to keep the reordering or not and if you want to show the dendrogram or not. So you can play around with those ones, explore the um, help page for this particular function a bit more and uh, see what you come up with. Let's move on to our next one. Clean up the environment first with our usual function rm. We'll take the argument list and the values from the function ls. And as our environment all empty, make sure you save your script every so often too. Right. Our next one is number three. Method number three is from the package pheatmap. And the function has the same name, pheatmap. If you need this package, you can install it with install the packages and the string pheatmap. But I already have it on my computer. So I won't be installing it now. You can check in your packages here, search for a particular package. If I start typing p heatmap, I can see that it's described as pretty heatmaps. And you might see why in a minute. I'll load this package back in my script library on p heatmap. Now it is attached. You can see the tick mark next to it. And I can see some information about the function itself, pheatmap. A function to draw clustered heatmaps, so that's an extra feature there. Oh, well, we have been playing with clustering so far. And one important bit here is that it specifies that one has better control over some graphical parameters, such as cell size. So again, quite a few arguments to play with here. I will be I'll be trying to showcase a couple of arguments that are interesting from this uh, particular function. So very different to the two first ones that we've seen. But here we're going to generate some data randomly. So we'll play with a matrix that we create from random normally distributed numbers and then feed that into the function pheatmap. So let's generate random data. Okay. Our matrix will be called D and it will be the output of the matrix function using 25 numbers that are randomly generated and normally distributed. That's what the rnorm function does. 
and we want to distribute them in five rows and five columns. Right? First argument is what we provide, what data we provide. Second one is the number of rows that we want and third one is number of columns. I can execute that, I get a matrix but I don't have names in there so I might want to add a couple of names. I can use again call names to populate that and I'm going to use a function called paste zero so very similar to paste but in this case the default separator is nothing so I can go to treatment as a string first and then numbers one to five execute that and very similarly using row names this time on the D matrix still using paste zero and this time we'll use gene and one all the way to five. So if I click on this matrix I can visualize it here I've got my column names treatment one all the way to treatment five and my row names from gene one to gene five. You can see that there's no separator between the two parts of my strings that's because I used space zero. Okay we've got our random data now let's try out our p-heatmap. As always I can start simple, only provide the data and this is what it looks like. You can see that it uses the whole space here that I've provided with my plot pane. So it's very efficient at that. It shows me my labels. I don't have to reorganize or to change any setting to see all my labels. It does that nicely. And I also have a key to the right that has a fairly intuitive palette. Um, blue for cold or low values and red for higher values. Let's see what we can do with this particular function. If I want to add a title I can go main equals pretty heatmap. There you go, it moves things around to make some space for it. In the description it was mentioned that I can play with the cell width and the cell height and be very specific about what I want to to use. So for example if I want 50 pixels for cell width and for cell height I want 30 pixels. I could specify that there and I get exactly what I want. And even if I zoom into it and resize the window it stays, it should stay the right size. Yeah. So if you really want to be specific about the ratio you can specify that as arguments. Another thing you can change is the font size. Let's say I want to make it slightly bigger here. I can say font size equals 12. And one great thing with this function is also that I can easily display numbers with the display underscore numbers argument and set that to true instead of the false default. And there's my numbers for my values on each one of my cells. We haven't used scaling so far. Now the default for pretty heat map, if I look at the help page again and look at scale, here it is. Corresponding values are row, column and none. So I can use the same values as before but if I look at my list of arguments, if I can find scale, here it is, the default value is none. So yet another particularity between those three functions here. By default it's set to none. If I do want to change that I can. I can add an extra argument and say scale equals, equals row for example to compare how genes have responded to those treatments. One other thing you can do with pHeatMap is you can add one single argument to save, to export your visualization. So you don't need to do that manually here. 
or use an extra function for it, you can go straight to the file name argument and say that you want to name this this export heatmap.pdf. Let's call it pheatmap.pdf. You can also specify a path to a particular directory. And if I execute this, I don't get a visualization in my plots pane, but if I navigate to my files, I can see pheatmap.pdf is here. I can open this and have a look at it in my favorite PDF viewer. And because it's a PDF, I can keep scrolling into it and it will always look good. Right, this is it for pheatmap. I want to clean up the environment now again before we move on. RM with the list argument taking the values provided by ls. Now I want you to summarize key, the key differences between the three functions. Summarize the key differences between the three functions. So something to keep in mind. For the stats package, or directly available when you start an R session, we've got the heat map function. And what a heat map function does is that it starts with scaling, by default on the rows. It then follows on to clustering and finishes by coloring the cells, right? In our second example, we saw the gplots function, or oh sorry, gplots package with the heatmap.2 function. And in this one, we start with clustering. And only after we scale, and the default is none. And finally, we color, and that's why we had to do an extra step of data manipulation to scale our data before it does the clustering step so we can see our different groups of proteins. Finally, we saw P heat map. With the P heat map function, and in this case, just like heat map, it first scales, but the default is on none, then clusters and finally colors the visualization. So that's something to keep in mind. You can keep that handy to remember what needs to be done before putting the data inside the function um, or better understand why two visualizations look different from one function to another. I'd like to finish with a fourth example, which is using a data frame in ggplot2. As you might know, ggplot2 deals best with data frames or structures based on data frames like tibbles. And here, we're gonna use a data frame and we won't need to convert it to a matrix. Now this is a very hacky way to do a heat map. It's not technically speaking a heat map because it doesn't have those dendrograms. We can't do that with ggplot2. However, it might be your favorite um, package to do data visualization in R, and this method might be all you're looking for to create a grid of colored cells. So I'm gonna add here the command to use if you want to install ggplot2, but I won't run it because I already have it in my packages, as you can see here. Ggplot2 is here. So here we're going to use a built-in dataset. I need to load my package with library function. And the built-in dataset is called Azoph. E-S-O-P-H. Question mark Azoph will bring up the help page for this one. It's a dataset coming from the datasets package.
And you can see that it's about smoking, alcohol, and esophageal cancer. There's a few different age groups included in this data set, and we're going to focus on one specific one. So we're going to subset the data to only look at the age range 55 to 64. So let's start with that. Subset the data. We want to create a new object called esof sub and use the subset function that's from base working on the esof data set and checking for the age group variable to be equal to the string 55-64. This is the age group we want to focus on. If I execute this, I end up with a soft sub. I can have a look at it in the viewer and confirm that I only have 55 to 64 in the age group column. So we also have the variables alcohol group and tobacco group, and finally number of cases and number of controls. So I'm going to start my visualization here. I'm going to visualize how frequent are our cancer cases in this population. I can more accurately call that frequency of cancer in this particular data set. So remember that we start with the ggplot function for a ggplot2 visualization. And we'll use our data set as of sub. And then the following aesthetics associated to the following variables. On the x axis, we want alk group, alcohol group, ALCGP. On the y axis, I want top GP, tobacco group. Now, this is what's going to define our grid of cells. On the x axis, the consumption of alcohol on the y-axis, the consumption of tobacco. We're also going to use a fill aesthetic here to fill our cells. And I'm going to use a formula here because we've got number of cases and number of controls. So I want a frequency here. I'm going to say I want the number of cases divided by number of cases plus number of controls and controls. This is my formula. I can add a plus after that. And I'll need to use a particular geometry called geom tile. I can already execute this and see what happens. Oops, sorry. Okay, if you don't get anything, one thing that might have happened is that your graphic device is still um, used by the previous function when we created a PDF with the function pheatmap. So if you don't get anything, maybe try a dev off, again a magic word, and execute that. Okay, so here we are, remember magic word dev off if you ever get an issue with generating graphics. So there's our basic visualization. We've got the default palette that's used for a continuous variable. We've got our frequency of cases here of cancer. And we've got on the x-axis alcohol group, on the y-axis tobacco group. So two categorical variables here to create cells. And then a continuous variable with the frequency of cancer in this population that fills up those cells. Now again, we've got a gradient that's not necessarily um, the best here, or a color scale rather, that's not particularly good, because often people suspect that the darker color is a higher value, but here it's the lighter color that's the higher value. So we might do a few things to modify our plot. We can change the color of our grid first change the color to white. So that separates our cells a bit more. That might be something that you want to do. 
We can also modify our scale the underscore fill underscore gradient function because we're using the fill aesthetic and we've got we're using gradient this default blue one we can change that and go to for the low argument or the low value we want white and for the high value we want steel blue for example So already we've got a better color scale here that goes from white for low values to blue for still blue for higher values. More things we can do, use a built-in theme like theme minimal to remove some of the clutter and this will remove especially the gray background that we might not want to keep here. So I'll execute that and you can see the effect, there it is. And one more thing that we want to do is change the labels because they're not particularly good. Tub group, elk group, and then our whole formula here that we used for frequency. We might want to change that and use the labs function to change the fill label to cancer freq for frequency. And then for our X label, alcohol consumption. And our Y label, tobacco consumption. And here you have it, this fairly, well, not particularly involved, but this um, different way to create a kind of heat map looking visualization in ggplot2 with your custom labels, with a formula being used to fill up the cells, depending on the data that you've got, modifying the scale or the gradient of colors using this particular tile geometry. So hopefully this is helpful. You've got four methods to create heat maps that we learned about today. I'll finish my script with removing all our objects. Again, clean up the environment with the function rm, the list argument, and the list of all the objects here. There is more to the material for this particular session. I will save my script and go to my browser. So in the video description, you'll find the link to this um, documentation, to this material. You can scroll through everything that we've seen today. There's the code and the output of the code, the different visualizations that we've tried. So there's P heat map and there's our ggplot2 visualization. Now there is an optional method 5 here that is uh, also included if you want to explore yet another method and it, this comes from the Bioconductor project so it's a bit more involved to install, not that much more, but you need to install the Bioc Manager package and then use the install function in that package to install the complex heat map uh, package. It makes use of that complex heat map package but also a fun uh, circle eyes package that's used to create a color ramp, a different color ramp. And you can have a look at what it outputs in the few examples here, see if uh, it does something that you're interested in. There's a few more links here available at the bottom specific to heat maps. If you're interested in looking into dendrograms on their own, the first link on slowcode.com takes you through a few examples looking at densities, making a heat map and then making it better using different groups with P heat map, um, using uniform breaks and then changing them to quantile breaks that might be more useful to create a beautiful heat map like this one, etc, etc. And there's dendrograms on their own. So feel free to explore this one too to go more in depth. And finally there's a uh, there's Leanne Wickens data set that's used uh, with heatmap.2 and an interactive heatmap2. So if you want to learn more about this protein data set that we've used in our example for P heatmap, oh sorry, for heatmap.2, this rpubs page will show you more examples. We'll go through it in more detail. And quite similar to what we did, but again mentioning dendrograms on their own and how to use them. And at the bottom this 
interactive um, heat map that shows you a tooltip with information about each cell you're hovering over. As always, there's a list of many useful links or what we think is useful at the library. Uh, you can go through those ones and they're really worth a look. Thanks for joining us today. You can close your RStudio and say don't save because you've got all the code to generate that data and you should be good to go back to um, your project by opening the rproj file and executing the whole script if you want to go back to where you were. Thanks for joining me and uh, see you next time. Cheers.